a little reminder, these weeks that we've been doing online kind of all build up to an in-person clinic that we will be doing. That is on August 9th. Uh, we're going to have Mitch Hull. He is a certified 3D Institute speaker, but he's also uh, been on an advisory board for the Olympics. He's coached D1 wrestling here at Purdue in, in Indiana. I almost said in Fort Wayne. <laughs> um, but he's done some really incredible things, and so he is a great guy. He's going to be speaking on our call next Monday here on Zoom, um, but we're also going to have him in person on the 9th, August 9th. Uh, that will be at Emmanuel Community Church. Uh, you can sign up and get some more information on our website, and I can send you guys all the link and all the rest of the information that we have on this call after the call. So I'll be sending that your way if you guys are interested in that. And it's a free clinic, so just another, another free opportunity to kind of dive deeper into what we're already talking about here. Um, so with that being said, today is week three. Uh, this topic is coaching the heart, so I'm sure it all <laughs> impacts us different ways, but I'm sure it means a lot to us. Um, so to start, I would love, we have a little bit of a smaller group, but that's okay, um, to ask you guys. So the question is, can any of you think of a time where the lack of confidence, a bad attitude, a conflict in the locker room negatively impacted the performance of one of your athletes? Maybe tough, but... <laughs> Yeah, I'd be happy to, to start on this. Um, you know, sometimes middle school can be the, the hardest time of life for some of these kids. Um, it's known that sometimes our bad actions and attitudes can kind of come to the surface easily at, during, that, during that time. Um, it, this was actually my first year of coaching at Summit where we actually had a conflict between two groups of girls who were in different I guess you can call them clicks, even in middle school. Um, but one accused the other of stealing a cell phone and taking pictures. And I mean, it just got really ugly. And, um, and it ended up being where the, the um, administration told me that I had to suspend one of the players for at least a game. Mm -hmm. So this kind of conflict continued throughout the year. Um, and it's certainly, when you have that conflict off the field, it absolutely affects the team unity and the ability to play together on the field. So it took a lot of time in meeting with the kids one-on-one -on -one and attempting to meet with them together. But um, it's, it's hard when you only have them for an hour and a half a day for two months and they're at school and dealing with those conflicts in the lunchroom and um and off the field as well so that that certainly <laughs> was not a, a good introduction this was probably 12 years ago and i've been coaching there for another 11 so it didn't stop me from from continuing to coach this school but it was a very hard introduction to coaching middle school soccer and i have I've since learned from that and probably would have done things much differently today but um that's why this things like 3d coaching is really important to start um, early in your coaching career and it certainly is life lessons going forward so thank you for for leading us in this effort Blair yeah yeah so for those of you who just hopped on the question is can any of you think of a time where the lack of confidence or a conflict in a locker room or an internal conflict affected the performance of an athlete that you've had for those of you just joining us I think over the course of my career, Blair, there's there's been a lot of different things that have happened. But in general, the biggest challenge for me has always been the selfish athlete. Mm -hmm. And whether, you know, I've coached from seventh grade to college, you know, half my career in college, half in high school as a varsity coach. And inevitably, there's that almost every year, some years worse, that one or two athlete that wants it all to be about them. And then that affects the locker room. It affects the way we play. I mean, I coach basketball, so it can become pretty evident when, you know, I've had players that were so obvious they wouldn't pass the ball to another guy. It's like, what are you doing? You know, it's like it's, this isn't a secret to us or the 2,000 people watching the game. But uh, that that challenge for me has always been there. And, and so as I got 
older and understood better, it seemed to me that the, the individual meetings were just real important. I just call them in the office and say, here's evidence of what you did today in practice that shows me that you're selfish. And, and you know, eventually it's not going to work unless you can change. And sometimes they change and get it. And unfortunately, sometimes they don't. But in general, that attitude is one of the toughest ones, uh, especially in high school, because they're, they're hearing it at home from mom and dad a lot of times, to be honest. They're hearing it from their buddies at school. And if they got two or three on the team, they'll join in. Then that makes it even, you know, more complicated. But um, you, you got to address it, I think, or it can just ruin the team. Yeah. Um, I'll hop in here. There was an experience um, with one of the teams that I coached where there was some conflict amongst the girls. It kind of ended up being two sides to a story and, you know, everybody was kind of divided on how they felt about it. So I won't go into all those details. Um, but within that situation, um, after that had all kind of happened, we showed up at practice the next day and honestly, you could cut the tension with a knife. You could just feel that something was off. Um, even though it wasn't verbally being spoken necessarily in that practice setting, but we did a drill. Um, it was a ball control drill. So we just had to get the ball, you know, over the net back and forth a certain amount of times, which isn't an overly difficult drill. Um, but we had a goal set and we actually ended up doing that drill the entire practice because we were not reaching our goal. Um, what's kind of interesting on the other side of that is we eventually had a team meeting that we felt was necessary to kind of work through the conflict. Um, and the next practice after that, we did that drill and we got the goal. Um, so it is interesting, you know, how that ends up working where, you know, that, that conflict within a team can really affect performance. So, yeah. Yeah. That's so good. And, and all of those, stories each one has been like yeah me too yeah me too like right like you can pinpoint that moment on your team or with your athletes of like yeah it's happened here or, yeah that's that's something similar has happened here so it's it's not something that just affects one of us or just affects one team or one area but um, issues like that are universal uh, so um, coaching the heart which is the topic for today is the true answer to combating some of these issues um, some athletes obviously are more stubborn than others as far as it comes to coaching the heart, um, but us as coaches need to take on that responsibility. So um, the 3D Institute says that a coach's words and actions can make a transformational impact on athletes. Um, so something to think about internally is um, does some of what you coach or does some of what I coach on the field or the court help our athletes at home? or help our athletes in the classroom, or help my athlete at work, or in a different setting than practice, or in a different setting than game, does some of what I teach help them in the outside world? Um, so what about the athlete that lacks confidence, the emotional athlete, the lazy athlete, um, the team having conflict internally? We need to address their whole being. So um, if you have your packet up, the first point there, so we need to address their whole being, their body, mind, and spirit. Um, and that's what the 3D Coaching Institute is all about, coaching at all three dimensions, all three levels there. Um, and their principle that they share for this is it, if, you, if you neglect any one aspect of your being, that would by definition not being the best you can be because you're not coaching at all three levels or all three areas there. So when we move from two dimensions to three, our athletes can experience true purpose and value. Uh, the 3D framework says that this is often how parents determine what a good coach is. So these are the three markers of how, how parents determine what a good coach is. So the first is, how is my athlete performing? Have I seen an improvement in my athlete from middle school to high school? Have I seen an improvement now with this new coach? So that would be the body, right? That's the first dimension. How is my athlete performing? The second is, how is my athlete thinking? Are they being challenged with new ideas? Are they becoming more mature? Are they becoming more um, strong spiritually? If you coach at a Christian school and you're able to share that with your athletes in some regard. Um, so how's my athlete thinking, which is the mind? That's the second dimension. And then the last one is how's my athlete being impacted? Um, so are they coming home and asking me questions? Are they coming home and Great, gaining new ideas? Are they uh, learning things about character? Are they learning things about discipline? 
um, those sort of things. And that's the third dimension. That's the soul or the spirit. And so our strength as a coach can be found in how well we, each aspect of those is formed or integrated into our team. And so the very first point today um, for this lesson is coaching the body, coaching the mind, and coaching the soul. We need to be a coach that holistically coaches those three things. Um, Joe Ehrman, he is a coach, but also he works directly with the 3D Institute. He says, if you want to be a better coach, you need to be a better you. And it's really simple, but that's very true, I think. I think a lot of those team um, unity issues or anything like that cannot be resolved without a coach gearing the head of that, taking charge in that. So we need to be a better person to able to be able to guide those awkward, those hard, those tension moments in our teams. Like with Kelsey's moment, like as a coach, you can't take a side, right? Like you can't say, well, I think this, you know, like you just have to figure it out directly and be mindful of that body, mind, spirit, that holistic way of to handling that issue. Um, so um, we've said it before, but I'll say it again. So the most influential person in our culture is the coach. Um, another 3D coaching principle that is great to share here, it says, great power requires great character for it to be a blessing and not a curse. So as coaches, we have to recognize that we do have power. We do have some say. Um, the 3D Institute even goes as far to saying that the two most powerful words in the culture today are coach says, right? A lot of the times our athletes don't even don't even glance, don't question it, like mom said, or, you know, when your child is saying, why mom, why mom? Well, I said so. Those type of moments, like coach says, so you just do it. There's no questions asked. Um, so no one wants to be someone's last coach, right? It's not fun to to have an athlete tell you they're quitting, not only from your team, but quitting the sport. So no one wants to be someone's last coach. Um, we must use our power. We must use our influence for good, power that blesses and power that doesn't control or wound or harm an athlete. Um, so another question I have for all of you is, have you ever coached a very talented team, a, ta a team that you think, you know, this team is going to be the team. This is the year that's going to take us to state or take us to the next level or Really, this is the year that we're going to look back on and be like, wow, <laughs> you know, we had a great group of kids that year. So the question is, have you ever coached a talented team like that that has just totally underachieved? And why do you think that is? I can share. Um, I think I mentioned before, I coach at Wayne High School. And typically, we have not been very good. Um, historically anyway and I've been doing this for nine years and through that nine years when I started we were absolutely horrible I think my first season we won the first four games and never again um, and we've always gotten better but something I've always struggled with particularly at Wayne is we don't have girls that play all year long we often don't have girls that go on to play college so we just struggle with them believing that they are actually decent or that they actually have a chance um, we have a pretty rigorous um, practice schedule like we we push them hard but to get these girls that rarely have ever played soccer or not quite close to this level but then we challenge them to be good enough to compete with the forces in this area it's it's a mind game we literally have to tell them you can do this whether you believe it or not and that's our biggest challenge is there have been so many days where we've stepped on the field and we've been just as good as the other team if not better but we have to get over that historical lie telling us that we stink. And so that's been something that, and especially in the last few years, we have slowly been able to overcome, um, which is an incredible blessing and it has really paid off, but it, it stinks that the mental game is almost more important than their physical abilities. Um, yep, amen. <laughs> Um, I would agree a lot with what Dana said. Um, and actually my example for the team isn't one that I've coached, but actually one I played on. Um, so in college, um, I truly believe, you know, those first few years um, when our team wasn't winning a lot of matches and not finishing high in the conference and not making the conference tournament, um, I truly believe we had a very talented team. Like as you just looked from athlete to athlete, I think on paper, you know, we I personally believe we could have performed at a higher level. 
Um, so as I look back on that as an experience as an athlete and think, you know, why, why didn't we achieve that? You know, why didn't we reach our potential? Um, one of my thoughts kind of goes back to what Dana said, just with confidence, you know, just this confidence of you are a good team. You have the pieces, you can put this together and be really successful. So I think for us, it, you know, it did come down to kind of that lack of confidence and not truly believing that um, we are a team that could compete at that level. Yeah, I've been on teams like that too. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, there's definitely, because like you said, from athlete to athlete on paper, it would make sense, right? Like we shouldn't be last in the conference right now. We shouldn't be, yeah. But you have to look back of like, why is that? Why, why are we not performing at that grade or at that level? It's very true. I think I think a lot of it has to do with the confidence. Yes, a lot of it has to do with maybe the coach. Sometimes I think there's only some something a coach can do, right? Like it comes down to the athletes when the whistle when when the whistle blows. There's nothing the coach really can do at that point because it's it's based on performance. It's based on exertion of what you've been told or what you've been coached. But yeah, there's I can point back I think to more times that I've been on a team than coached. Obviously, because I haven't been coaching crazy long, but. Um, it stinks. It's not, it's not fun to be on a team where you're like, we just lost again for, you know, and, and then people are like, why'd you lose? I don't know. You know, like, how do you, you know, as an athlete, that's hard to combat too. Um, but yeah, so it's definitely tricky. Um, so a 3d principle that helps us with this is, um, it says you dare not be a tour guide to a land you've never been. Um, so as coaches, we have to kind of get to the root of that issue, the root of why maybe our athletes are not performing or achieving at the level we would wish they would be, or we know they can be, um, whether it's confidence, whether it's the history of the team, whether it's any outside factor, um, something like that Stan mentioned earlier of that one kid who, um, maybe is, doesn't have the best attitude and then it starts to affect two kids and then it starts to affect three kids and then you have the whole team uh thinking negatively or it's kind of like branching a ripple effect of a negative attitude um and that can really tarnish the whole season it can ruin your season and so getting to the root of that getting to the the source of why that is maybe it's that one child maybe it's um, a bigger issue than that um, but 3D says you dare not be a tour guide to a land you've never been. So we have to combat these issues as individuals um, and figure out ways that have worked for us of how to get through that to benefit our athletes, to tell our athletes, hey, this worked for me. When I was having this conflict with one of my teammates when I was an athlete, this is how I handled it or that kind of thing of sitting down with that athlete and saying, this is how I benefited from this situation, even though it may seem like it sucks right now. Um, of how to combat that. Um, so the uh, second point as we're getting there, so it talks about care and understanding. Um, so when we care for our athletes, we have to understand. So the 3D framework says that understanding is the basis of care. You need to understand each aspect of your being to care for it well. So um, I think of like a doctor. So if you're a brain surgeon, you have to know every intricate working of the brain, right? I couldn't go in and perform a brain surgery. I know nothing about the brain. I'm not a doctor. I don't have a degree for that. Um, so same thing for our coaches, right? We have to know our athlete. We have to know the heart of our athlete before we can care properly for that heart of that athlete. Same thing for our sport. I could not coach golf. I just couldn't. I don't really know much about golf, but I know a lot about soccer. So I can coach soccer, right? But we have to coach the athlete. So if you really know your athlete, then you can more properly educate them, learn them. It's kind of like a learning style, right? Not everybody learns in a classroom from lectures. Some kids need PowerPoints. Some ki kids need visual aspects, those kind of things. Um, so we have to seek understanding. So in our, in our worksheet or in your packet there, um, you need to seek understanding first for your role as a coach, your role as a coach that kind of points back to your what's your why what we talked about. Um, the second is the purpose of the sport. So why are your kids out there playing soccer five days a week in 90 plus degree heat. Why are the kids out here. The third is the conforming pressures of sport. Um, the culture of sport. Um, 
there is a lot, a lot, a lot of good content that 3D uncovers where it talks about the play of sport and the culture of sport. So the play of sport would be like, as a kid, you're playing like backyard games and it's fun and it's not competitive. You're just out there to be out there and play. Like I think of like kickball in elementary school. It was just something that was fun that we just did at recess. But as you get older, you start getting on teams, you start getting new coaches, and it becomes competitive. And then that creates a whole other environment of sport. So that's not what we're talking about today, so I won't get too into it. But it's, it's good stuff, too. Um, so the second point for the day overall is to seek understanding. Seek understanding to care for the heart. We must understand in order to properly care for the heart of our athletes. All right, so when identity is found in sport, so kind of what we talked about last week, a bit of when our athletes misalign their identity with their performance or things like that. So um, it says when identity is found in sport, significance is found in winning. And then it says that our value then is found in performance. Uh, the dominant motive is fear. So we have a fear of like, if we don't perform well, coach is going to be mad. Or we're going to have to run on Monday, not going to be good for us. Um, so it's motivated by fear. And then the dominant attributes of that are pride and insecurity. So that's all when our identity is found in sport. So before we get to the next section where it says identity is aligned correctly, I want to ask you guys a question. So can you guys describe a time when your team's desire to win created an unhealthy atmosphere? And how do we respond to that? So describe a time when your athletes desire to win created an unhealthy atmosphere. Well, I've certainly had teams where that's been, been the case. And I think the one, the biggest thing for me as a coach, two things happened to me. I came out of the 70s, graduated in 76 from Taylor, by the way, go to you. Uh, sorry, Huntington. Uh, so anyway, uh, you know, I came out in the Bobby Knight era. And so that's, that's how you coached in Indiana, man. I got after kids and I was intense and, and, and it was probably came across to them as, Hey, we got to win. You know, there was this fear you talked about a performance based and and I had a, a real love for athletes even then. I just didn't know exactly how to to show it. You know, I would do it off the court or whatever. But which probably makes messages even more. But but a real shift to becoming uh, positive in, in more like the late '80s, early '90s. Just understanding the the positive comments that you can make. And I read an article once that. I think MBA students had went and, and watched Tom Izzo to practice in the 90s, and they just marked down positive comments to negative comments. And when it got done, it was six to one ratio. And that article has always stuck out in my mind. Is that the way if somebody came in and listened to me coach, would there be a six to one ratio or four to one or whatever of just positive comments? Is that a way to go? That's good. That, you know, and then you still correct. And so that, that mind shift really helped me. And the second one was just becoming so involved in the process. And you hear Nick Saban talk a lot about the process. And I think some coaches say, well, it's easy for Nick Saban to say he's got, you know, NFL players and they're number one in the country every year. But I think if you listen to him, it really is about the process. And so as I've, as I've matured as a coach and made it about the process, the kids then don't get the pressure to win. It's, it's what is the process today? And then you go into a game, what is the process of this game and it's to be the best you can be the best team you can be and we probably all had teams where we played terrible and won and we've had games where we played really well and got beat by a team that's just better than us mm -hmm. and in a sense as I became more confident and more comfortable those games were just as important to me and the ability to talk to players and say look you played better today and you just came up short now how do you take that and become even better for the next game so I think positive attitude and process are two things that can really help in the way that you handle your teams. Yeah, that's good stuff. And Stan, I'm going to go back to something you had mentioned earlier about the the athlete that thinks they've they've got to do it all, that they see themselves as the superstar. Yeah. And um, many times that that pressure has come from the parents too. Um, that I found that. 
Um, at least at the middle school and high school level, there's so much pressure in these kids to be the superstar so they can show off to potential college coaches mm -hmm. and get that elusive scholarship that they all want, that they've been putting money into travel sports for X number of years. Yep. And so they, they believe that they need in order to justify all the, the time and money that they've spent. And um, there, there have been multiple times on middle school teams where I feel that, that parent pressure on these kids. Yep. And all of a sudden, no matter what the coach says, um, the kid knows their parents are in the stand and they hear from them you know, so much about this is on you, this is on you. And then the team falls apart because one kid try. now this is soccer again. <laughs> so the one kid tries to dribble the ball all the way from one end to the other. And then by the time they get in front of the net, they're too tired and they don't, <laughs> too tired to shoot and score. And they don't even see anybody else on the field. So I wonder sometimes going back to, you know, the 3D coach principle or one of the suggestions, uh, you know, with a, a home visit, you know, and today it might be a 10 minute Zoom call that if the parents and coaches can somehow get on the same wavelength and the kid is hearing the same advice and information from both of us, how much better that would be for team unity and how much that would turn into a winning attitude and a winning team if we followed that principle. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and put a plug in here if you guys are taking notes or whatever, but a website you may want to go to is the lens book t-h-e-l-e-n-s-b-o-o-k the lens book and it, and it deals with this idea debbie of uh parents and how we coach parents how uh our athletes are being affected uh and i think you'd find and you can get a newsletter there now i'm going to tell you it's really really good but i also have to tell you it's written all by my son so they're, 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 he's written two books, but it's about this exact same stuff. Shameless plug. Yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> but I just got put that up front. But I think you would find it as a coach and a parent, really good stuff. Because he's dealing with a 13 and 11 year old now who's doing all the travel sport. He's been a varsity basketball coach for 15 years and then retired to write books. And I think you'd find it interesting. So get on it, get on his website and get on his mailing list. And uh, that's that very stuff you talked about, Debbie, he deals with every week. Mm. Awesome. Sorry, I had to put that in, Blair. Hey, that's all right. <laughs> I get it. No, that'd be good for all of us to read. Yeah, because that's so true. We we are coaching the parents in a sense, right? Because you they're they're at every game, they're yelling at their kids just as much as you are, right? Like I've had I've been on teams, I've been on there was a travel team I was on, same kind of scenario, a girl who tra soccer again, but a girl who thought she could do it all. And, and we were juniors and seniors in high school. And I think us as teammates of hers were more upset with her than our coach even was. Cause we were like, we're all looking for scholarships too. Right. Like, and it wasn't about scholarships, but it was like, we're playing a game that we all love. Let's share the love. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's, it sucks. It's a, it's an environment that's definitely hard to, hard to combat, but yeah, we're, we're coaching the parents just as much as we are the athletes and that's more and more even now in this culture in this world of today sports that we're dealing with parents and parents who are more involved we like it's it's two things right we have the parent who is the parent who is early to practice picking their kid up on time at every game at everything and then you have the parent who's like oh my kid plays soccer I didn't know like you know like you have the two very ends of the spectrum at high school and middle school probably at least um where it's very involved or very disinvolved so yeah it's the parents are definitely something we need to to pay attention to too um so with that being said so we talked about when our identity is found in sport and the significance is found in winning so when our identity is aligned correctly significance is found in serving that's what the 3d institute says and then our value is found in our being and then the dominant motive is love and then the dominant attributes are humility and gratitude. So that's the kid we want to coach, right? We don't want a kid who's selfish, who's fearful of us, who um, is building up pride or insecurity or um, unconfident. But we want an athlete who knows that they're loved, who knows that they have a humble attitude when they win, have a humble attitude when they lose, are, are gracious and grateful that they get, the, get to play, let alone get to win or get to coach on a – or get to be coached by an, a, a person who cares about them. So – 
Um, let's unpack that a little bit more. So you as a coach obviously need to ask yourself, where do you align your identity? Do you align your identity in yourself as being a coach? Do you align your identity in being a Christ follower? Do you align your identity in your, your job? <laughs> do you align your identity in, um, well, I coach three sports and I, I have these titles or I have this certification or whatever it may be. Where do you align your identity? Um, and that points back, of course, to the what's your why, but it's crucial to think about that. When you step onto the field, where's your head at? Where, where, what are you thinking about? Do you walk in there with your chest puffed up thinking, these kids have no idea who I am. I've won three titles or is it, I get to, I get to speak life into these kids every day from, from Monday through Friday, I get two hours with them. So I got to use those two hours, right. To, to teach them something about themselves. So as coaches, we cannot misalign our identity. We have to think about that. So we can love our sport and love the competition. We can love the the grit, the good wins, the hard competition, but we have to know that our worth is not defined by that. Our worth is not defined by that. Um, and it's, it's hard to swallow that pill sometimes, especially when you win a hard game or when you do get that SAC championship or you do get that state title. Um, because that's the, those are those resume points, right? Like everyone wants to tell people about that and everyone asks about it, right? Like well, how many games did you win this season? Well, whether it's a winning season or a losing season, we can't find our identity in that. So um, being 100% engaged in our coaching, we have to be 100% engaged in coaching the athlete's heart. Um, and we also have to be 100% engaged in our development as a coach. Um, so congratulations, you're here. So that's, that's something that tells you you're, you care about exploring that development as a coach and care about challenging yourself as a coach. Um, but when we lead with our heart, we're at our best right? When we leave with our heart, we're at our best and at our greatest value to the athletes and those that we compete against. Um, we also get to experience the best joys that sport has to offer when we coach with our hearts and coach with our heart first. Um, and some of those best, best things that sport has to offer are the joy of winning, right? <laughs> it's fun to win. No denying that. Um, another is satisfaction and fulfillment and accomplishment, right? When you see an athlete finally get something right, or those aha moments that we talked about a couple weeks ago. Um, another one is growth and resolution, even in defeat. So even when we lose, we can point to those things that we can work on and we know we can get better at. That's a joy, I think, of, of finding a, a resolution to a potential problem or a potential issue you're having. And then another one is a sense of God's presence and pleasure with us, right? That may be the ultimate one, right? Of knowing that God looks at us and saying, you're coaching well, you're serving these kids, you're, you're doing it right, you're getting it. Um, even if you're, if you feel like your athletes aren't, <laughs> if you're putting in all the work that you can to be the, your best um, and coach with that Christ-like mindset, that's what it's about. Um, so remember that this is our journey first. Um, our hearts have to be transformed first. Like the 3D Institute says, we can't be a tour guide to a land we've never been. So maybe this is something we need to work through ourselves before we can even implement it this season or um, whenever your season starts, if it's the winter or the spring. Um, but we have to go through this ourselves first. And so um, the last point of the day, the third point is find your identity in Christ and not in athletics. Find your identity in Christ, not in athletics. Um, and that can be hard, you know, like I, I've dedicated my life to soccer since I was three years old, I started playing. And so it's, it's really easy to get entrapped by that. And I'm sure that's the same for both all of you guys here on the call. Like if you're a coach, you've probably dedicated your life to this sport, right? That's all you think about. Like Dana, I know Dana says this a lot. Her favorite time of year is soccer season. <laughs> it's not the fall. It's not Christmas time. It's not um, the end of the school year. It's soccer season. And that's true for me. Like, that's the best part of the year, right? To get to watch games, to get to coach games, to get to be on the field. That's, that's the spice of life, right? Like, it's what we live for. But it can't be the only reason we're living. It can be what we live for, but it can't be why we're living. Um, so just remember that when you're stepping onto the field, you're a Christ follower first. Um, so yeah, so thank you guys for being a part of this journey. Um, Mitch Hull will be with us next week leading the Zoom call. Um, he will be again um, at the clinic on August 9th at Emmanuel. So make sure you guys sign up for that. Um, and if you have any questions about the clinic, feel free to email me or um, go explore some more on our website. But thank you guys again. Um, and can I get someone to pray us out?
I can pray for us. Okay. God, thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to be coaches. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to never take that for granted. Um, what a beautiful gift it is to invest in the lives of our athletes and to coach a sport that we're passionate about. And God, I pray that these things that we've talked about during this time today that regard our identity and coaching from the heart, I pray that we would take that with us, that we would think about these things, that we would apply them to our coaching, um, but also to our lives in general. Um, so God, I pray that you would also be with us next week as we listen to the speaker, and I pray that it would just ignite a newfound passion in us um, to pursue coaching in a whole new way that ultimately honors you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Well, we'll see you guys next week. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, Blair. Good job. Bye. Thanks, you guys.